Hello and welcome to the Institute for Peace and Diplomacy's running series on the current landscape of Sino-American relations, where we have aimed to shed light on the challenges and opportunities for US and Chinese bilateral relationship in a 21st century that is increasingly defined by multipolarity and the specter of great power politics. I'm Arta Moini and I'm the director uh, of research here at IPD. Um, IPD is a nonpartisan, non for profit North American international relations um, think tank committed to promoting and amplifying provocative, innovative thinking in North, in North Atlantic foreign policy. We stand for dialogue, diplomacy, prudent realism, and military restraint, principles which we believe are the four cornerstones of sustainable peace in an increasingly complex and dynamic international system. Our guest today is Klaus Rinn who is a professor of politics at the Catholic University of America, where he was also chairman of the department and the founding director of the Center for the Study of Statesmanship in Washington, DC. CSS, where I also hold the fellowship myself, is dedicated to the study of the philosophical, cultural, moral, and political dimensions of foreign affairs and uncovering the preconditions for peaceful international relations premised on mutual respect and understanding among statesmen, peoples, and civilizations that is in keeping with American traditions of restraint and prudential statecraft. Professor Wren is editor of the journal Humanitas. He's author of numerous books, including A Common Human Ground, America the Virtuous, Will, Imagination and Reason, The New Jacobinism, and a novel, A Desperate Man. He has published and lectured widely on both sides of the Atlantic and in Asia, especially China. He gave the Distinguished Foreign Scholars Lecture Series at Beijing University, which published the series as a book at, called Unity Through Diversity in Chinese Translation. Three other of Ren's books and many other of his writings have also appeared in Chinese translation. In 2012, Beijing Normal University named him Honorary Professor. Professor Ren, in a, in a spirit of full disclosure, Professor Ridden is also a mentor and a friend of mine, and he was a member of my dissertation committee. So it is my absolute pleasure to welcome him to the program. Uh, Klaus, Professor Ridden, hello. It's good to be with you. Um, I wanna start our conversation by thinking about um, the new uh, rhetoric that's uh, re rising over the past, um, certainly years, but got intensified after COVID, um, which pro prophesies a, a sort of a new Cold War, that there's a new Cold War coming between US and China. And um, I wanna ask you as a uh, political theorist, a historian of ideas, and all of an interest and understanding of foreign policy, uh, why do you think, what drivers do you think uh, this new Cold War rhetoric has and do you think such sort of Manichaean all or nothing attitudes have some ideological drivers that we need to explore further? First of all, uh, simple realism makes you recognize that there will be tensions between major powers of one kind or another. The question is always, will they be able to manage those tensions? Will they be able to overcome the annoyances of the moment and develop relations of mutual respect. And the question always is, what stands in the way of that kind of, shall we call it diplomatic interaction? Well, a major complicating, complicating factor is uh, human nature. Human beings tend to become uh, preoccupied with their own interests. Uh, they tend to be disinclined to see uh, the point of view of the other side. This is something that we have to contend with. This is a part certainly of the West, the traditional Western view of human nature. Uh, and so the key problem when it comes to uh, achieving peaceful relations among individuals, groups and nations is to try to contain that in human nature that makes for conflict. This is the heart of the problem identified by the Greeks, by the Romans and by the Christians in the Western world and identified almost in the same terms by Chinese tradition, specifically the Confucian tradition. 
if you want to build peaceful relations, this has to start with human beings, with the assistance of society, taking charge of their own selves and subduing that in their own natures that tends to produce conflict with others. That said, uh, one has to note today that there are developments in both China and the United States, which would tend to fan the flames. Imagine, for example, that one of the parties in a two-party conflict is operating on the assumption that it has a monopoly on truth and virtue, that it has the authority to speak for all mankind, that by definition sets up, up a confrontation with the other party. Imagine, for example, that you have the belief that America is called by history to remake the world for the better. That America is specifically uh, given the assignment of spreading democracy in the world, kicking out dictators. And if that is the mission of the United States, if that is the moral mission of America, it goes without saying that that will not be well received by the other side if it has a different point of view. If it insists then on asserting its, what it sees as its legitimate interests, it's nevertheless going to be perceived as an enemy in proportion that it resists the ambitions of the missionary power. So what I'm saying is that in international relations, not only do we have to contend with what is inevitable, this human inclination to wish to lord it over others, to have it your own way, but we need to contend with ideas, self-understandings that give one's own side uh, authorization, as it were, to proceed with disregard for the other side. Now, to the extent that this becomes a governing motive, uh, and to the extent that it conceals a simple will to power, the odds are that the two powers are going to confront each other. Uh, there, <clears throat> there's an element of lack of tolerance in the very idea that one of the parties is God's gift to mankind, that it is the side of right. They wear the white hats then by definition almost, the other side wears the black hats. So right there, uh, in proportion, as these kinds of sentiments get abroad, uh, you're headed for conflict. What would be the antidote? Well, the antidote, according to traditional Chinese civilization, and according to traditional classical and Christian tradition is for human beings to rein in, to restrain their disposition to become uh, bossy, belligerent. Now that, um, that requires character. This is why the classical traditions in China and in in the West and in the United States emphasize so much the need for character formation. The lower part of human nature needs to be contained. Are we succeeding in this? I think a long argument could be made and I'd be willing to make it later on if you so desire, uh, to argue almost in disregard of these traditional notions of virtue and to proceed instead on the assumption that America is by definition superior to its competitors or 
opponents, that it has a moral mission to which the other parties need to yield. So this is uh, this gets to the heart of the problem, right? Um, and I want to unpack that a little bit. Uh, you mentioned sort of this drive, um, almost a moralistic drive, a universalist drive. I know best. There is an absolute, and uh, we only have that privileged access to the truth. And so the other side is always going to be the other. Um, so you wrote a book called New Jacobinism. And um, you have talked about the origins of neoconservatism and their uh, projects of empire. Um, and it seems to me that the, the kinds of people you're talking about uh, mesh a lot with the neoconservative and liberal internationalist folks. And so I wanna ask, and you also mentioned that actually the neocons have, uh, in that book, New Jac Jacobinism, you mentioned that the neocons have a lot more in common with revolutionary Jacobins in France and that the moniker of conservatism that's used for them is highly um, misleading. So my question is, how does, if you can give us a history of, of that, of what was the origins of this kind of thinking? Why does this kind of thinking permeate uh, US foreign policy establishment, so-called the blob? And um, how, how does that tie in? How does that new Jacobin view of the world tie in with the increased hawkishness toward China. I'll get to China and the Confucianism aspect of their tradition uh, later, but here I just want to focus on the U.S. sort of state cap first. What is, the, what is the origins of sort of neoconservative thought? Why it wasn't successful and why the new Jacobinism, uh, what is new Jacobinism? Well, uh, let's talk first then about the old Jacobins. Who were they? They were the pioneers, the intellectual and other pioneers of the French Revolution of 1789, or that started in 1789. And what kind of thinking uh, did they represent? They, uh, Robespierre, for example, was mighty taken with one Jean-Jacques Rousseau, uh, the author of The Social Contract, The Emile, and other very influential works. What Rousseau argued was that all of Western civilization was one huge mistake because it had assumed along the lines of what I was talking about just recently, that human beings have a moral problem in that they are morally divided between higher and lower potentialities. Uh, traditional civilization had taught human beings to be on their best behavior, partly so that they could be tolerable for others in their vicinity. Human beings left to their own devices will tend to become self-indulgent, belligerent, greedy, cruel, anything you want. They need to restrain that inclination in themselves. And if they're lucky, they will have parents, communities, societies that will assist them in this task. This view, according to Rousseau, was a profound misunderstanding. There is no evil in human beings. They are born good. They come out of nature good and such evil within citations or within quotation marks as we find is attributable to a perverse civilization that has enslaved human beings. Human beings are really born for self-government. They have nothing to fear from themselves. If there's one thing that Rousseau utterly rejects, it's the idea, idea of laws that are binding over time and that are superior to the popular opinion of the moment. Constitutionalism that is restraining the popular will of the moment is to him anathema. Real popular self-rule, real popular freedom means rule by the people, the majority of the moment. What stands in the way of this proper democracy? He doesn't call it democracy, but that's uh, for another time. What stands in the way of true popular government? Nasty dictators, perverse inherited institutions. What is needed is for those to be swept away so that the people can really become what 
nature has given them by way of potential. A brotherhood of man within a communally oriented society is what awaits human beings. But first, everything has to be swept away that's standing in the way. Hence, the revolutionary temperament. This kind of thinking was um, an inspiration for the so-called Jacobin clubs. The origin of the name Jacobin is that um, a prominent discussion club uh, met in a, an abandoned Jacobin um, monastery in Paris. But there were hundreds of such groups spread out over France where, one, where there was debate about how humanity might be liberated. So the Jacobins were, um, shall we say, the intellectual and political spearhead of the French Revolution. And we don't need to talk about the stages of the French Revolution, but we all know if we've studied history that the Jacobins appointed France as the liberator of mankind. France was to be the missionary nation. It was to do the job of spreading the good that nature promised man. And so what did you get? Wars, for what purpose? Certainly not in the estimation of the Jacobins in their own self-interest or to um, achieve more power for themselves. No, this was for equality and brotherhood and freedom. Freedom, equality, and brotherhood. That's the formula. That is what the missionary purpose of France was supposed to be. And so the wars started. The new Jacobins are the ones who speak the same kind of language only in the United States. They say that America has been given by history the task of liberating people. Mm -hmm. uh, different neo-Jacobins use uh, different language, but the words that keep coming up as describing the purpose of this mission is freedom or democracy or democratic capitalism or, or something along those lines. Democracy is the thing. That is, it's assumed that democracy is by definition the form of government for which humanity has always been intended, but has been kept from realizing. Well, now, the new Jacobins in the United States are going to push that uh, system of government, which is, of course, recognized by all enlightened people as being what humanity has always asked for. It's just a matter of time before all of the, uh, all of the dictators, all of the totalitarian systems will be gone. And uh, when everybody recognizes that liberal democracy is what humanity has always waited for and deserves. So armed with that ideology, the new Jacobins have justified a, um, you can call it different things, but an imperial ambitions, ambition. Um, there's a phrase that describes this pretty well, and that is armed ideology. Because of their ideas, because of their ambitious venture, they need to mobilize great power. You cannot achieve anything as glorious as a global democratic revolution without having great resources at your disposal. And the muscular American military power is made to order for this great task. And so when the Cold War ended, the new Jacobins were quick to say that this is an historical opportunity for the United States to turn its attention to the final realization of the goal for which mankind has so long been waiting. So having previously uh, been used to defend against Soviet expansion, 
the military might of the United States was now to be employed in an even greater venture. This is what I define briefly as the new Jacobinism. I don't mean to say that the old Jacobins and the new are identical in all respects, but they do share this idea that their country is special in the world. It sort of breaks the mold for, um, uh, it, of history and it is uh, deputized as it were to become the savior nation, the missionary nation. So, so, the, so the holders of this new Jacobin ideology are, is it correct to say that they, they are the new conservatives or is there more people other than new conservatives that are new Jacobins? We have to be careful when we use these terms, including new Jacobins, because people who have been called neoconservative are not the same. Um, I could give you a number of examples of people who are routinely called neoconservatives who may not fit the ideological model that um, I was referring to. But there are a very large number of people who've been called neoconservatives who fit uh, the picture pretty closely. I could rattle off a large number of names. I guess uh, Robert Kagan comes immediately to mind. Uh, we could talk about uh, William Crystal, and I could give you a very long list of names that are uh, well known. Uh, Charles Krauthammer is no longer with us, but I would say he was um, one who came very close to embodying almost all of the um, attributes of the neo Jacobins, as I understand them. So, so who, who, like, can you give also an example of a neo conservative person who is not a neo Jacobin? Well, the uh, national security advisor, Ronald Reagan, for example. Uh, a person you may recognize as a professor at uh, Georgetown. Do you know who I mean? Jean Kirkpatrick. Ah. Interesting. She actually, um, she was embraced by the neoconservatives because she had expressed a certain hawkishness uh, that appealed to them. But uh, especially toward the end of her life, she expressed reservations about the kind of thinking I described, which showed pretty clearly that um, she was not um, of that ilk. Okay. Um, I also have another follow-up question, which is uh, granting your points, very insightful and interesting points about um, the idea of wanting the equal brotherhood of mankind, um, but and also really focusing on a popular will of the moment. Why is it, does it always have to, is it inevitable that the Jacobins, whether new or old, 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 who are proud of their tradition, of their, of their uh, liberal democracy or their democratic form of government, why can't they be content in their own borders? Why does it have to always become a universalist globalist project? Um, does it have to because of the mankind element? Like, is their project less valuable unless their exceptionality gets um, generalized into the entire world and projected outward? Um, is that, is the full sort of domination um, the only sort of reprieve for the success of the project at home? Think for a moment about the framers of the US Constitution. They were preoccupied with the need to restrain power, to decentralize power, check, checking and balancing power. Why was this? Why was it so important? Well, it had to do, of course, with their view of human nature. They know that human beings, for whatever reason, desire power over others. So what are they gonna do? Uh, nothing was further from their minds than by trying to root out the desire for power. That would be the same as rooting out human beings. So you know what sort of a system of government they try to set up. And it was all about politically doing a kind of work that was even more necessary in the personal lives of individuals. 
as we were talking about before. Character is necessary in order to put a damper on the not very pretty side of human nature. So uh, interestingly, the culture in which they lived, which was a classical and Christian culture as mediated by British culture, surrounded them with what you might call checks on the desire for power. They were taught by classical works, Greek drama, for example, and even more by the, uh, by the Bible, the kind of threat they're always living under. What threat? Not the threat of other human beings, although there is one, but the threat coming from within themselves to wish to lord it over others, for example. But the language in which this subject was discussed in their sources, classical or Christian, was always such as to warn against letting your self-indulgence run away with you. It was always a call to restrain yourself for your better angels, for the sake of your better angels. Now, what happens with the new Jacobinism and its forerunners in America is that a language gets abroad, which does not put down the desire for unlimited power, but fans the desire for power. Suppose you persuade yourself that you are really God's gift to mankind. You can work wonders in the world. Should you not really have all the power in the world? And should anybody be allowed to stand against you? If you carry around an idea of that sort, that you are special, that you are entitled to power, is it any wonder that you will feel more entitled to power? That is to say, a, tra a trait that is inevitable in human beings, and not necessarily, by the way, um, an evil trait by any means, will get out of hand unless you are carefully watching yourself, and unless your society is carefully watching itself. This is what I, I see as the heart of a response to your question. That is to say, the old culture, the old Western culture, warned against a desire for power, as, especially as disassociated from character and self-restraint. The new Jacobinism does the opposite. It encourages, it panders to the desire for power. It declares you have a noble mission. You are wearing the white hat and you are justified to deal harshly with the people who are wearing the, hard, the black hat. I mean, it, to put a Nietzschean vent on it, it seems to me that, it, that the rise of Jacobinism and um, the idealist move in, uh, it sort of anthropomorphizes the God of the Bible uh, and puts him into your, brings him to your level. It sort of mixes the individual with, with God-like status. And so it sort of allows for, for the meager individual who before... And, they, was, and yes. maybe just uh, interject there that uh, it's not a coincidence that the human flaw about which the ancient Greeks warned the most was hubris, thinking that you're one of the gods. Mm -hmm. The gods will strike down people like that. Nemesis will strike them down. And what is in Christianity the greatest sin, the cardinal sin? It's pride. Right. And you find in the Bible any number of references that pride goes before a fall. There's those who are going to be struck down. They are 
the ones who are claiming extraordinary, exceptional power for themselves. They don't know their place in the eternal order of things. So it seems like the new world order um, coming to be or wanting to come to be in modernity has a, has a thing against limits. All sorts of checks and limits, it seems like, whether it's uh, constitutional limits, but also limits in terms of your own power and the belief of what you need to accomplish in this world. Um, yes. Again, everything that's supposed to be done in the realm of divinities and gods is now supposed to be done in the realm of the, of the human. Uh, then the human is tasked to do very great things and change the world. I mean, this is the, uh, it's interesting because every, every person that, that maybe you see, every young person that you see would want to change the world. I, I wonder if this is a, uh, that's maybe taking us away from our exact topic, but I wonder if this is some, some sort of a pathology of our modern times that everybody needs to change the world. <laughs> I don't think it's taking us away from, uh, from um, the real world at all. I don't know how many times I've advised students who say that they are interested in public service. And I imagine that in nine cases out of 10, what they're talking about <clears throat> is not so much public service as power for themselves. They have seen how leaders in the Congress are catered to, how they have chauffeurs, limousines. They would like to partake of some of that. But they call it a desire for public service. I do not mean to disparage young people who have an interest in politics, but I think that entirely too often what they're aspiring to is not serving the common good as the framers of the US Constitution may have wished, but to be somebody's, uh, to have influence so that others will cater to you and admire you. And of course, when you get to thinking that you really are entitled to govern the entire world, it's certainly not far-fetched to think that you are aspiring to godlike power. So I think what you put your finger on, um, you know, I was struggling with this issue over the past month and a half, which is, you know, the almost in the wake of the withdrawal from Afghanistan, uh, there was an almost full um, concerted effort across uh, mainstream media, uh, professional classes, um, probably many of these people that uh, aspire to careers in public service to change the world to rehabilitate uh, you know, the new conservative imperial project, the liberal internationalist projects, um, you know, to clean up their reputations that had suffered a lot um, because of the disasters in, uh, in all of our global war on terror and in wars in Afghanistan and, and Iraq and uh, all the disasters that had followed. Um, so I guess this, this maybe partly explains that. Is there... Do you see other reasons for why? Um, why is this sort of like, there is this almost this marriage between the professional uh, managerial classes, uh, what some might call the, the state that you can't see, the deep state, and uh, mainstream media and the military and everybody sort of like trying to push this message. Maybe the new Jacobin ideology is so ingrained that uh, every time there is any decision, um, you know, that deviates from that, even if it's made by, uh, you know, the, the, the person of their own party, President Biden and President Trump both wanted to leave Afghanistan. Uh, but they, uh, you know, they come, they come and they try to rehabilitate this picture of why we needed to be there and what our presence in all these places prevented. So uh, do you think we are, I mean, this effort is going to be successful? Um, maybe um, they, they had never lost that real power and influence that we had thought that they had lost. And what would that mean um, for the sort of the future of their influence in the liberal imperium? And especially what that would augur for the Sino-American relations? Because it seems like China provides a perfect foil. Uh, you know, Afghanistan, Iraq, you know, even Iran, these are places that most people don't care much about. Uh, most ordinary folks don't want to be there, don't want to be uh, uh, bogged down there. But, but they, they, 
both on the left, uh, both on the sort of center left and center right, the bipartisan consensus seems to be that China is this nemesis. Um, and it needs to be not just, um, you know, defended against if there's a security threat in the United States, which is perfectly just, but it needs to aggressively be contained. So my, I wanna see if there is a link there between um, this effort to rehabilitate new conservatism and new Jacobin ideology um, across all channels in the culture. And what we are seeing also in terms of increasing hawkishness towards China. Well, let's get back to China in, in just a moment. First, um, let's discuss for a while what it is about this uh, neo-Jacobin impulse that gives it staying power. Mm. Uh, and of course, the, the neo-Jacobinism of the last 25, 30 years or so has its forerunners in previous American idealism, for example, in Woodrow Wilson. But what is it that gives it such appeal so that um, after it seems to have been completely discredited, it rises again? Uh, take, for example, the disaster that was the attack on Iraq. How is it that the people who were endorsing were spearheading that war have not lost their credibility. Exactly. How can they return all the time? Now here's a, an analogous question, and I'm not talking about different things here, but they are analogies. Why is it that in America's universities, you have all kinds of leftists who are in some way even more radical than the old-fashioned communists. Is that not strange? Look back into the 20th century and you discover that communism, organized communism in the Soviet Union, in uh, China, Cambodia, I could go on, murdered people in the millions. It created the gulag. Now, if you familiarize yourself with that record, you have to ask yourself, how could this possibly have happened? This is an atrocity beyond belief. It's the most murderous century in the history of mankind. So you would think that since this is known to most people, they would say, never more are we going to give a hearing to anything that sounds remotely like communism. But it's happening. How do you explain it? I think the explanation is fairly simple, and it is this. All people need to have a high opinion of themselves. They need to think that I'm a decently good person. And the question then is, how am I going to get my own approval and the approval of others? What must I do in order to have a good op uh, opinion of myself and have the good opinion of others? The old Western standard made it difficult to achieve a good opinion and a good sense of yourself. You were supposed to follow the Ten Commandments. You were supposed to do all kinds of morally strenuous things to rein in your lower nature. Hard, hard work. But if you were capable of that, you might become capable of loving people in your vicinity, loving neighbor. You know, the person who often presents you with inconvenient challenges, the person who complicates your life, the person who may not even be very likable, but you're supposed to love that person, shoulder responsibility for that person who is your neighbor, who is within your daily range, as it were. How do you measure up according to that standard? By showing character. In the family, for example, nobody can get away with pretending that he or she is better than he or she really is. People see through it immediately. 
Why am I mentioning this? Because with something like the new Jacobinism, another standard by which you can judge yourself becomes available. And what is the standard? Am I a lover of humanity and the good of humanity or not? That very fine. And, and what is the answer? Yes, I care more deeply about humanity and its good than anybody has ever done. And how do I prove it? I want to employ the military resources of the United States, if necessary, in order to do good, not just for this, that, or little, uh, this, that, or the other neighbor, but for all mankind. How is that about moral, uh, for moral heroism? I am a moral giant, and I'm proving it in insisting that the world has to be made over in, into something entirely different. So what happens here when you point uh, to what the communist did <clears throat> in the 20th century is not that the new Jacobin says, oh, well, um, I will have to rethink things. There was obviously something very wrong with this messianic way of thinking about transforming the world. I'm clearly on the wrong track. That's not how they react. Why? Because they have such a very heavy investment in this ideology that gives them a high view of themselves. They may in their personal lives be impossible to live with for the spouse or people at work or fellow students or whatever, but in their own estimation, in their own imagination, they are moral athletes. Hmm. And if somebody then says, yeah, but look at the practical consequences of your kind of idealism, they do not draw the conclusion that there's something wrong with their ideals because their ideals is what gives them personal worth. No, they say, you can't blame my ideals for what Mao and Stalin may have done wrong. They clearly were mixed up on the means. But next time, when I, the moral hero, is doing it, it will be done right. This is fascinating because, you know, um, if you think about neoconservatism in general, right, uh, what really drove them was this anti-communist uh, uh, streak. But what you're pointing out is the universalism and the idealism that's so profound in most of these modernist ideologies uh, without the limits actually unites them, sort of completes a circle where you see that the, um, the totalitarian impulses of the communist regime for changing the world for the better in a deterministic fashion sort of fa uh, maps on also to the uh, you know, progressive Wilsonian uh, move to want to change the world for liberal democracy. Uh, both of them need to use force and might and military power to do it. Yes, and then all of a sudden, you confront another power, a rising power, as the theorists of international relations like to call them. You uh, are challenged by China. And what is your natural reaction as an idealist who champions a better world for mankind. It's one of hostility. Mm -hmm. uh, you're not what you're supposed to be. And so you start criticizing everything that is wrong about that other power, in this case, China. Now, what is very interesting about this, among many other things, is that this idealist is always disinclined to criticize what might be called closer to home, the flaws in the United States, the civil rights catastrophe of America's inner cities, for example, the murder rates that have been, well, um, shameful for decades and decades and decades. And you could argue if you were prone <clears throat> to self-examination that we'd better do something about cleaning up our own act before we try to clean up the world. 
I mean, that would be in keeping with the classical and the Christian tradition and the tradition of the framers. First, you clean up in your own house, your own family. If you're capable of doing that and you have some moral energy left, then by all means, try to spread your benevolence out into the larger society. But before you have done that, before you've proven that you know what good action is in the first place, you'd better be humble about your international aspirations. Can you have a nation that is not belligerent, that is made up of people who have grown up egotistical and self-indulgent? Suppose, imagine a society where the old work of self-restraint is no longer undertaken, but the young grow up spoiled, belligerent. Narcissistic. Narcissistic. What are they likely to turn out to be if they turn their minds to foreign policy? The same thing. And so there's tremendous danger in a huge power like the United States, not attending very diligently to its own citizens, to make sure that they have the responsibility, the character that will comport with tremendous power, military and otherwise. If you fall down on that job, you are flirting with conflict. And if it were ever to come to a conflict between China and the United States, that will be a Holocaust beyond anything we can imagine. So we're playing with this. These idealists who claim to be so noble are in effect, I do not hesitate to say this, they have in them a streak of the diabolical. That is, it's not that their ideals are noble and that Mao's means were mistaken. No, there's something sick about their idealism. Idealism in the, of, of this kind is not admirable. It's a scary phenomenon because sooner or later, it means it leads to tyranny and killing. Is it, is it the idealism by itself or is it the fact that the, the kind of idealism that they have almost always uh, is universalist at the same time? Well, in one sense, in one sense, we have to have idealism in the sense that we try to imagine something that is better. We see, we identify flaws in our own society and in ourselves, and we use our imagination to come up with something better. If we didn't have that, if we didn't have idealism in that sense, there could be no improvement. What I've been talking about is a particular kind of idealism, which has built into itself a kind of self-approval, which has no other justification than, that, than your own assertion that you represent good. And, and, uh, and it seems like this sort of ideological idealism almost, this sort of absolutist uh, view of oneness and certainty almost always has to get you into a universalist footing. Because yes. And, 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 and since, it, we, since we were uh, talking about China, uh, let's uh, pay some attention to traditional China. I mean, we can talk for a very long time uh, about the fact that uh, China does pose a challenge for American policymakers. That goes without saying. The mm -hmm. question is, what kind of challenge is it? And here you have to look back into Chinese history. And you have to realize that um, China has never shown any kind of strong disposition in the direction of outward expansion. China has been historically not an expansionist power. If you say that imperialism is native to China, I think you have to qualify by saying that that imperialism has usually been directed inward. 
That is the uh, central control has been a sort of um, theme in Chinese history. But then you have to remember that this notion of control directed inwardly is connected to a culture that has much in common with the culture of restraint that I was uh, discussing with reference to the Western world. And I think um, I might uh, accomplish something quickly by simply reading something out of the Chinese tradition that speaks about what traditional American culture sees as the sources of sound political leadership. What ought a leader be like who is expecting to have a good influence in a society? And I'm going to quote from something that is called the great learning. It's not a, a big work or anything. It's a, a statement, a shortish statement that is attributed to um, Confucius himself, although we will never know whether he had anything to do with formulating these questions. But this great learning, it expresses the Chinese conception of the relationship between good individual character and order, peace and order. Uh, I'm gonna read you an abbreviated version of the great learning. And I'm sure you'll see pretty quickly how this links up with corresponding sentiments in Western ethics and religion and American uh, ethics and religion. This is how it goes. This is the great learning. This is, describes the good leaders of China. Wanting to govern well their states, they first harmonized their own clans. Wanting to harmonize their own clan, they first cultivated themselves. Wanting to cultivate themselves, they first corrected their minds. Wanting to correct their minds, they first made their wills sincere. And then I skip a little. When the will is sincere, the mind is correct. When the mind is correct, the self is cultivated. When the self is cultivated, the clan is harmonized. When the clan is harmonized, the country is well governed. When the country is well governed, there will be peace throughout the land. Now, this could have been Aristotle. Oh, it could have been, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, this, it's the whole culture of restraint, the need for self-reform in order to prepare the way for social communal reform. This is the all-important em emphasis that the new Jacobins simply skip. They talk a lot about virtue, but what they mean by virtue is being true to their ideals, to recognize that America is an exceptional nature, that America should be a missionary power. So virtue has nothing to do with being humble in thinking that first you have a lot of work to do on yourself. No, virtue is being true to your principles or to exhibit what the, uh, many of the neoconservatives used to call to have moral clarity. Do you believe in right or wrong or not? Well, if you believe in right, then you believe in your principles and you will want to enact them in practice. And interesting how that maps onto the friend enemy sort of distinction that many, many new, new conservatism many neoconservative circles also make. You're either with us or against us. Yes. If you choose the good, you're with us as we define the good with, more, with our own moral clarity. And if, you're, if you don't, you're obviously against us and you deserve to be uh, annihilated. So that, that kind of uh, that gets back to that uh, almost a destruction of the other, a nemedical process that's you know, informed by an all or nothing zero sum game over truth and good 
and beautiful. So uh, it's interesting to... Uh, the reason I'm bringing this up, or one of the reasons I'm bringing this up, is that a picture is very often created <clears throat> as if China were some sort of monolith that is geared to um, very distasteful ends. That's what it is. And America is infinitely to be prefer preferred because we stand for all of the noble things of liberal democracy. What is forgotten in this kind of view is that what Rush Limbaugh used to call the chai comms come in many, many different forms. Now, students of political theory had to smile many decades ago when the Chinese Communist Party clarified its ideology. Now, if you know Karl Marx, you know that for him, society inevitably was um, turning into a uh, heavily, uh, sharply polarized state. It was the capitalists, the owners of the means of production on one side, and the proletariat uh, in its miserable uh, poverty on the other side. Well, guess what? It was a long time ago that the Communist Party defined its, its um, task as representing the workers and the entrepreneurs. I mean, it's almost laughable from the point of view of Marxist orthodoxy that thinking of that kind might be possible in the Communist Party. Now, is that kind of thinking still around? Is it still as influential? I'm not enough of a sinologist to be, uh, to be able to uh, comment on that. But one thing is clear, and that is that within the Communist Party, within the Communist Party elite, there are shades of opinion that contradict the view that we're dealing with some sort of monolith. Now, clearly the current president is reigning in, he's tightening control. Now, one thing is very clear about China, and I think this is recognized by, by all commentators, and that is that if there's one thing you cannot do in China, it is to question the primacy, the political authority of the party. But, it is also recognized by many in China that as long as you do not aspire to political influence, you can go fairly far in speaking about issues that are not exactly conducive to communism. It's amazing. I, I spent a lot of time in China, as you know, and I was surprised to find the extent to which Western anti-communist literature has long been available in translations. It's not just that you have English translations of Shakespeare and things like this. You have translations of Edmund Burke and you have translations of Hayek. You have all kinds of things. And this is tolerated or was tolerated perhaps to a greater extent by the communist party leadership. And right within the intellectual elite of the Communist Party, you have people who flirt with ideas that overlap with traditional Western standards and thinking. Notice now that you have a sort of a clamp down on deviant political views and other views that the kind of sentiments and attitudes that are disdained are things that would perhaps have been similar in Western society if you go back 50 or 60 years. For example, uh, there are attempts to um, deflate pop stars. It seems that uh, celebrities ought not. This is what the regime is saying. It seems that these the influence of the pop stars is go, uh, getting out of hand and we have to contain this. And they, are, uh, they go after the sissy boys. They do all kinds of things that, although they sound harsh to us, are not all that different from the taste of an older era in the Western world.
Mm. Now, ultimately, of course, the Communist Party is doing this for the sake of their control. They will not permit any contest with regard to that matter. But what I'm saying is that although currently the Communist Party seems to be um, moving in the direction that's problematic from the Western point of view, right within the party, you have a wide span of different views. And you probably know well that um, the Chinese Communist Party is making use of Confucianism. Of course, what they are making use of, what they found find very uh, conducive to their objectives is the patriarchal attitudes of Confucianism. So they will stress that, but by putting their stamp of approval on Confucius, they're also raising the stature of Confucius. And you don't need to look very far to discover in him something that is about as antithetical as Marxist, uh, to, to Marxist communism as anything could be. Right. I think this is a very uh, valid point um, that, you know, despite the name, co you know, communism, we're not talk talking uh, in People's Republic of China with a traditional uh, classical communist uh, regime. It's obviously been uh, permitted by uh, both Confucian and other sort of traditional uh, Chinese uh, cultural elements that have permeated into the ideology of, uh, of the modern Communist Party. And I, and I think this sort of gets us to what you have already alluded to a few times already, and that's uh, the notion of sort of exceptionalism. Um, I want you to unpack that for us a little bit as to, um, you know, what, what do you think is the, um, the sort of the, there's a longstanding understanding of American exceptionalism. Um, and you alluded to that in terms of, uh, you know, we have this mission of missionary zeal. Um, and China seems to also have its own understanding of uh, pride and superiority, um, sort of Chinese exceptionalism. Um, do big civilizations, uh, great powers, do they need to have a sense of exceptionalism? Is that something that's natural? And, and then what are the differences between their excep exceptionalism, uh, between American exceptionalism uh, and Chinese exceptionalism? Uh, you made it uh, made the point that China is less outward the expansionist historically, while uh, America and American exceptionalism seems to justify a normalized empire. Um, I would like to see if we can unpack that a little bit for our audience and uh, talk about a bit about that, and also the how the different conceptions of superiority and uh, pride in, in self and wanting recognition. Uh, how might that uh, play in the future sort of Sino-American relations, um, particularly in the sphere of military escalation and armed conflicts? I was born, raised, and educated in Sweden. And uh, at that time, it considered itself the exceptional nation. There were only 7 million people, but they knew that they were the conscience of the world and they paraded for all of the noble causes. By that, I mean to say that it comes naturally for countries, even if they're not particularly big, to think of themselves as having something special to offer. And in a way, that sort of exceptionalism is sound because there are very few countries that don't have anything to take pride in. Um, if nothing else, their cooking may be superior to that of other countries or something like this. So all countries have something to take pride in. What becomes dangerous is the kind of thinking that assumes a kind of blanket superiority to every other country. And you find that, of course, in Woodrow Wilson, perhaps to some extent, even in earlier Puritanism. You know, there's uh, something to be said uh, about, we, I'm not going to do it now, but you could make a long argument, I think, about the Puritans, the Calvinists, importing from the Old Testament a kind of tribalism into uh, American thinking. As we are now, we Americans are now God's people. Why? Because of our beliefs, because of our uh, compact with God. 
So there is a, a, a streak there of self-importance. I wouldn't want to overdo that because I think uh, this notion of America as a city on the hill, on a hill has been misused. Those Puritans were uh, intensely aware of their own sinfulness. It's something that Calvinists really stress. But there might be, even in the original um, American founding, the, uh, the older founding, something of a sense that we're special and that the whole world is observing what we are doing and we'd better be on our best behavior. But nothing was, of course, further from their thinking and in viewing themselves as a city on, the, on a hill than to think that uh, America ought to be aiming toward world domination or a missionary role. Um, what is important to remember here is that to the extent that this kind of idealism that we talked about previously informs the exceptionalism, it becomes unwieldy and it becomes eventually tyrannical. Uh, and if the opponents of the particular country are not lucky, this will mean war to them. I mean, you take the Nazis as an example. Um, National socialism is to a very great extent an effort to tell the Germans, you are special, you are entitled to expand. I mean, it's another version of the Jacobin temptation. Now we have it, we've had it in the United States. And um, as I was saying before, in proportion as that sentiment informs the notion of exceptionalism, you, you get an armed ideology. Uh, now, insofar as China is concerned, uh, we're dealing with, I think, a much different kind of exceptionalism. And it's a complex exceptionalism. Others who know this uh, better than I do uh, can comment further on this. The Chinese, even though they call themselves communists, are acutely aware that they are an ancient, ancient civilization. They also have a sense that, especially since they are such an ancient civilization, that was, there was something profoundly wrong with their being put upon by outside groups the colonial Western powers, for example, or more recently, uh, the Japanese invasion. You hear in China about the rape of Nanjing as if it happened yesterday. Uh, the Chinese tend to have long memories and if they have deep, deep suspicions, even hatred of the Japanese, it has to do with China having been um, drastically maltreated by outsiders. Now, I, the, the complexity of the Chinese um, exceptionalism, which has to do with its uh, ancient heritage, has to do also with a sense of inferiority in some areas. Much has been written about the encounter between ancient Chinese civilization and modern natural science. Chinese, enlightened Chinese, felt for a very long time that in some respects China was backward. This made for a, a kind of a, a split personality and many set themselves the task of trying to reconcile ancient, fine, noble Chinese civilization and natural science. Um, of course, what has happened in China in the last hundred years or so is that Western science has been made integral in, West, in uh, Chinese society and that the Chinese are even outdoing Westerners in some aspects of natural science. But that means that now they no longer feel quite the same inferiority 
uh, that is now you have a sense of their own achievements in natural science as coupled with their ancient civilization to say nothing of their general economic progress. So you have here um, a composition of something that amounts to, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of exceptionalism. The Chinese are certainly aware of being special. What I worry about, although it does not seem to be in keeping with Chinese tradition, is they're developing something of a mirror image of American neo-Jacobinism. There's always been in China, and uh, that's certainly been the case in uh, the post-war period, a nationalistic streak, um, a tendency to look down on other people. I don't want to go into that. Um, it would take us too far. But a danger I see is that in responding to what is perceived as the pressure from the United States and the Western world, the uh, Chinese will do what so many leaders have done over the centuries, namely fan the fames of nationalism and uh, feeding the beast, as it were. Uh, the reason I do not immediately have deep fears of that is Chinese tradition. But China is also changing, and it is under great pressure. The United States, with its 800 bases around the world, it's patrolling the South China Sea. It has offered, although somewhat ambiguously, guarantees to Taiwan. And I could go on and mention reasons why the Chinese would have every reason, just on practical grounds, to arm themselves. But what would happen if the pressure becomes acute? Would there then be the danger of a nationalistic impulse being generated within China? Then you, you would have an explosive. You mean, you mean an expansive or outwardly focused nationalism? Yes, yes. I mean, to some extent, you have to understand that China is outwardly interested. They have enormous problems of um, finding natural resources, oil, et cetera. They have to have far-flung interests. But the United States uh, is so accustomed to patrolling the seas and having an interest everywhere that they may, precisely because of these international interests, be forced into some sort of confrontation. It all depends on how subtle and sophisticated both parties are. Uh, are they going to uh, be able to avoid conflict? I mean, it's, it's, I mean, it sounds, it was very interesting how to hear you speak about this. On the one hand, we have this, you know, original Chinese exceptionalism that is mostly uh, defensive, self-contained, self-referential, almost uh, what you expect an ancient civilization to have is sort of a natural sense of self and, and a personal superiority, but it's, uh, it is not absolutist. It is not uh, sort of a, uh, blanketed over others. Uh, on the other hand, you have this sort of absolutist uh, sense of exceptionalism that's, that's mission that has missionary elements, that's millenarian, that's absolutist, that is tied into the uh, idealism um, and gets his gets a lot of uh, sort of staying power from that idealism. And it's active and activist and even aggressive. And so what you're pointing out is that the, the sort of the aggressiveness of the, of the Western or American exceptionalism specifically um, can, can uh, you know, given the dislocations of modern life and modernity and the Chinese Communist Party push aside those traditional elements of Chinese exceptionalism for a more new Jacobin elements that is really uh, in, in some ways maybe important sort of nationalistic pressures to then fight the, the new Jacobin element on the, from the West with new, new Jacobin elements from China, from the Chinese side, which will be- mind, Keep in mind that uh, the Chinese leaders, the president in particular, um, must face tremendous difficulties 
in keeping uh, his authority and keeping China united for all kinds of reasons. The, um, the economy, insofar as it is permitting market forces, is in itself a threat to the discipline, the disciplinary, disciplinary uh, imposition of influence. Um, any any, any uh, student of um, economic liberalism knows that economic liberalism tends to produce uh, political liberalism. And I think the, uh, the president of China is acutely aware of that. So it's, it would not be far-fetched if at one time or another, he and his party will try to come up with ways of appealing to the imagination of the Chinese people in order to resist internal disruptions and pressures from the United States. Yeah, and, and this also seems to be, you know, the, the struggle of almost all traditional societies with, with uh, the coming of moder modernity and modernization to, to have to deal with the uh, traditional uh, restraints and traditional uh, virtues uh, at the same time as having to, uh, you know, reorganize your society and restructure your society to get the benefits of the science. And uh, you know the first the first element is in, sort of an inferiority complex that goes with the colonial moment in which uh, most of these uh, uh, cultures or countries uh, came face to face with modernity for the first time in uh, any way. And so the so question becomes, what should be done by either side? And it seems to me that much more thought ought to be given to the, ch uh, the chances for developing synergies, building bridges, as we used to talk about during the Cold War. Uh, now there's something very paradoxical about the, the conditions prevailing relating to this issue, what should be done. Uh, I spent enough time talking to very influential Chinese to know that there are people among them in very influential places who feel perfectly comfortable inviting me to speak. I've been in China seven times at the invitation of leading institutions of various kinds. And I've talked to many members of the Communist Party who belong to the party intellectual elite. And I find that I have more rapport with many of them than I would if I turned to typical professors in American universities. Are they in China? You might think that since they are communists, they are chai coms, that they would be into wokeism and cancel culture and all of this. No, they're not. Of course, there are some who trend in that direction, partly because they're pandering to trends in the Western world. They want to be recognized by American academics. But on the whole, that is not the trend. So the paradox I'm referring to is that if you try to reach common ground by appealing to traditional American and Western civilization and appealing to traditional Chinese civilization, all kinds of opportunities open up. American constitutionalism is of great interest to many people in China. It's not that they think that it can be imported. It's just that they, they recognize a certain familiarity in the framers of the US Constitution. This sounds like Confucius. I just read you the great learning or bits and pieces of it. What's this? It has Chinese flavor. Now, I am fully aware that the Confucius Institutes uh, that have been um, established in various uh, American institutions of higher learning may be a mixed sword. I don't know enough about it. But the very fact that the Chinese are trotting out this pillar of traditional culture, Confucius, 
should make us realize that here is possibly an opening for reconnecting, for achieving a limited common ground in areas that matter greatly to whether we're going to avoid, be able to avoid war. I mean, if we're not able to do that, war will come. That's, that's the horrendous prospect. If you have belligerent people facing each other and restraint is almost absent, then you get a Holocaust. Why are we not busying ourselves finding the common ground that could help to diffuse the belligerence insofar as it exists on either side? That's a very powerful point. Um, I was gonna end right there, but I, it strikes me, I mean, I have a follow-up question on that, so I have to ask that. Um, being a bit cynical or skeptical here, but it seems like there are people in China, maybe guided by um, their own traditional background, Confucius schools, there are many Conf uh, Confucian inst uh, institutions, mostly sanctioned by the state, but you get, the ideas are there to be read and uh, critical people can make their own mind always at some point. So there is an element of Confucianism. There, is, there are other philosophical traditions as well. In, in China, like, uh, like Lao Zi and Taoism. Um, it seems like there are alternatives to the new Jacobinism that's being forced upon, uh, that might be forced upon uh, China, China, some Chinese elites, especially the Western educated Chinese elites, um, so that they can find their own way. But when we talk about America, especially with the, and, and, the, and the sort of the Anglosphere especially, America, Canada, uh, Great Britain, Australia, we see a different sort of a puritanical streak that then uh, sort of got meshed up with this idealism that we mentioned and gives a certain sense of exceptionalism that uh, it is in many ways um, millenarian and neo Jacobin. It is also almost the only game in town. So when you talk about, I mean, you saw that in, the, in what we discussed earlier, but in the sort of the whole of the system, all of society efforts almost to rehabilitate the people who should have lost all credibility and account, and they should have frankly been held accountable for their wrong decisions, but they were not. And they are the same people who will come on TVs and make uh, points about why we should have continued to stay in Afghanistan for another 20 years. So my question is, it seems like the kind of tradition that you're talking about, the American constitutional restraint tradition of some of the founders, um, because even from the beginning, there were, there were some neo jacobin elements in America. Uh, I'm talking specifically about Jefferson. Um, so if you think about you know, the fact that Jefferson, Lincoln, um, moving, you can keep moving through the line, um, Roosevelt, Wilson, um, the, the FDR, the other Roosevelt, they all had a sense of they need to do something to make the world better. And, and if I caught, you know, there's almost a thread, there's a common thread that unites them. And it feels like that constitutional restraint tradition is almost entirely absent other than in, in you know, discussions among a few uh, learned people that are talking amongst themselves uh, and talking about old books and great uh, books and traditions. How is it that America and the entire Anglosphere can be reconnected to that constitutional tradition? Because in my cynical view, we, have, we are far past the American Republican stage and we are well into an American empire space. And as we know with Rome, um, once that, that shift is made, uh, it's very hard to go back to a republic, but what you can really expect is more tyranny. Now, the intellectual circumstances for some sort of return are not very favorable. And I think what needs to happen in order for there to be a more genuine return to the spirit of American constitutionalism is for all kinds of very influential intellectual assumptions to be pushed to the side. Um, one of those influences is so-called anti-historicism. 
as formulated by Leo Strauss and his disciples. That is, they are propounding a version of Rousseau in this respect. Uh, if you want to be a clear-headed thinker, a philosopher, you will disdain tradition because tradition is always just whatever history has thrown up. For people to be, revere a tradition or to uh, revere the ancestral is to become a value relativist. It's to give up on principles. Now, many, many people today who claim to wish a return to American constitutionalism are doing so while inspired by this sort of ahistorical thinking. That is, they, they see, when they speak about the Constitution, what they're thinking about are the principles, so-called, of the Constitution, rather than the character traits, the spirit of restraint that was the necessary precursor of constitutionalism. So that when they start talking about returning the Constitution, it tends to become another instrument for pushing the American thing on others. For example, the Claremont Institute, which was um, a creature of the Straussian political theorist, Harry Jaffa, had a gala, I think it was in May of last year, to which they invited Mike Pompeo, the, uh, shall we say, bullying secretary of state. And what did he do? He talked about America's exceptionalism. And because America is exceptional and is a sort of a, an aberration in human history because of all the good it's called to do, is that America demands respect. This is not exactly what was on the minds of George Washington and Madison and the others, that America exists to get the respect of the world. Their minds were on what might assure liberty to posterity. That means we have to undertake a very demanding moral project as well as a political project. What's happening now is that many of the people who were in a sense inspiring the new Jacobinism with its principles are now speaking about a need to return to American constitutionalism, but quite often assuming that this will make America more assertive in foreign policy. Why else would uh, the Claremont Institute invite somebody like Mike Pompeo? Now, he had been an appointed Secretary of State by a person who claimed to be opposed to the forever wars, and he brings in one super hawk after the others, beginning with McMasters and uh, John Bolton and then Mike Pompeo. And Mike Pompeo is invite, invited to be the gala speaker and making the argument that to believe in American exceptionalism is to be as assertive as he had been in the conduct of foreign policy. So there's a lot of intellectual confusion here. What needs to happen at minimum in order for there to be a genuine revival of American constitutionalism, the spirit of it, the character of it, the constitutional personality is for that anti-historicism and that belief in ahistorical principles be cleaned out. That has been highly detrimental to the evolution of so-called American conservatism. It needs to go. Um, I, I, I just mentioned that I think Claremont Institute uh, had there a lot of uh, different thoughts. Um, the, it's not a monolith, and there are a lot I know, of I know. differentiating thoughts. I now. think that they are they they are shaping up, coming to their senses, as it were. But there's entirely too much of that lingering, um, abstract idealism, and tied to. Jefferson and the Declaration of Independence, that is to say the few first few sentences, and then a, a very, um, shall we say, biased interpretation of Lincoln and so on. 
um, that, that's a whole can of worms. That, yes. <laughs> but um, no, I mean, I, even as I hear, hear as I'm hearing you speak about this, and you know, if if you're to recreate a zeitgeist that is um, that is fruitful for uh, statesmanship, for virtue and character, and of leadership. It's, uh, and not just a set of abstract principles, not to um, abstractify some principles from the, from the moment of the zeitgeist and then try to uh, you know, use that, which is also going to be a new kind of new Jacobin project. Uh, it seems to me though, that still we, uh, the question of how is, very, is gonna be very uh, powerful um, because you know, all of these institutions, um, most, almost overwhelming majority of these institutions, if I have to be specific, on the right and the left, uh, have uh, a lot of vested interest in a new Jacobinism ide ideology and the new Jacobins, as you mentioned, the new Jacobin impulse has staying power because it, it, it sort of is a substitute for meaning in a meaningless world, an nihilistic world as Nietzsche put it. So that substitution, uh, appears to be very dangerous. And unless we are kind of starting from ground up and making a new kind of society, which is another kind of activism, <laughs> how are we going to be able to, uh, you know, um, return to a spirit of uh, living restraint? And I mean, this is, uh, I was just thinking out loud there, but, I, but if, if there's any uh, response, I, I'll, I'll love to hear it. Well, I would only add that, um before you can apply remedies, you have to um, diagnose the situation. What's the problem? And a lot remains to be done here. The fact that um, neo-Jacobins are able to return to center stage and offer their views routinely, uh, sometimes even with increased influence, tells you that there is something profoundly wrong with the ability of American society to recognize where the problem really lies. It's staring you in the face, but something about our mindset makes it impossible to see. On that note, I wanna thank you, uh, Professor Rin, uh, for accepting our invitation and talking to us today about China about America and about a whole lots of things that percolate in the background, but usually in conversations about diplomacy, peace and foreign affairs are ignored, I think to our, uh, and we see the results of it, uh, the disastrous results of it at times. So I hope that we can have more nuanced conversations with you and people like you in the future. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Um, I'm also going to, say one last thing. I ask uh, everyone, this conversation is going to be uh, on YouTube, uh, on the IPD channel on YouTube, as well as on Rumble. And uh, I hope that you guys enjoyed this conversation and you will subscribe to our channels on Rumble and YouTube. Thank you very much and bye-bye.